So if you would, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Pray with me. Father, uh, thank you so much for the privilege to be with my brothers and sisters here. Thank you for this conference and all that I have learned uh, from those who have gone before this t uh, presentation. And I would ask, Father, that you would use these moments to affirm what we know that is right, to correct us in what we think we know is right but that is wrong, and then to teach us what we need to know. Would you, Father, go beyond the speaker by your spirit, his incompetencies and his inabilities, and use your word by that same spirit to speak to the hearts of those that are here, that it would be profitable in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you'll turn there, if you'll just turn to that point. Let me start this way. Um, uh, this is kind of a combination talk and uh, and sermon, I guess. Um, it's a kind of combination of the two, and I'll give, let me tell you why. So in January of 1972, I was, um, I was driving a 1968 Chevelle with my wife who was expecting um, our dog, a six by 12 U-Haul it, that everything we owned was in it. I had $75 in my pocket. We're driving up Lookout Mountain, and I'm starting into Covenant College because the Lord had called me to the ministry. I was leaving East Carolina University, that uh, kind of known as the Athens of the East, and uh, that, was, that, that was a joke. And, um, and so I'd left there and uh, had been exposed to Covenant College, couldn't wait to get there on my way. But I drove up $75, all that I just said to you. I didn't have a job. We didn't have a place to stay. If my kids did that, I'd, I'd probably kill them today. <laughs> but uh, we came up um, three years later. I've graduated. We had no debt. And the Lord had thrust us into ministry and on to Westminster Seminary. Something happened in the context of all of that. And as I arrived there, as an older gentleman, his name was Jim. That's all I'll say because I haven't got permission to use his last name. An older gentleman named Jim who saw me and realized he needed to take some kind of, um, some kind of uh, pity on me to help me out. He, was, uh, he had left the military, had spent two years with Dr. Schaefer at Labrie, and had actually worked as, uh, as Dr. Schaefer's house servant and, uh, and, was, uh, and had met his wife there and had come to finish at Covenant College. Uh, he would go on to get a Ph.D. and uh, involved in writing, et cetera. But then he, he was in his last year, and he saw me coming in, and he took pity on me because I was just kind of wandering around, and I did not know where I was, what I was doing up until that point, I thought my head was simply something you used to put a baseball cap on so you could play baseball. That was pretty much it at East Carolina. And uh, now I was being challenged in class, and he would meet with me in the blink, and he would talk with me, and then um, he would talk to me about Dr. Schaefer, and I got to know him. Little did I know, three years later, I would be Dr. Schaefer's bodyguard at the first American Labrie, and uh, so I got to walk around with him with a 38 and uh, to protect him and uh, ask him questions while he would walk around the grounds. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life, but I was learning about him from Jim, <clears throat> and then Jim, uh, and then Jim did two other things besides befriending me and telling me about Dr. Schaefer and introducing me to him and what he taught. Another thing that he did is he, he went over to our house one day. I mean, he took us over to his house and he took me to his library, which was an entire garage filled with shelves that actually were on rollers to back up. In other words, his library was bigger than the town I came from, that library. And I had never seen that many books in a, per, in a personal library. And so then he and his dear wife came up to spend a, an evening with us, and we, um, he said to me, let me see your library. <laughs> He said, let me see your library. I said, sure. And I took him into the bedroom where my desk was, our little um, apartment that we were renting. And then I showed him my library, which including the books that I had just brought, bought for that semester, uh, filled up three-fourths of the windowsill. And he said, no, I want to see your library. I said, that is my library. Uh, up until then, books were something I used to prop up, open the door at my dorm at East Carolina. And I, so that was my library at that moment. He said, we've got to do something about this. And so he bought me a, the biography of George Whitfield by Arnold Dalimore. It was life-changing, absolutely life-changing. Then the next thing he did, 
is he bought me a copy of Preaching and Preachers, and I was going to bring it to you today, but I talked to my books. My books talked to me, and, um, and then my book said to me, I can't make the trip. Uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> It is utterly worn out. I'm, I'm afraid if I had brought it, I wouldn't have been able to get it back. And um, I read it, and I will never, never forget in that little uh, time of reading it, when I was reading through it, I said, this is why I'm here. And then I looked on the back, and I saw that this was the collection of the Preacher's Conference that had been put together to make this book at Westminster Seminary. Well, that caught my attention. And I began to find out about Westminster Seminary. Now, by the way, do y'all know that that conference, he, that all those lectures took place in that conference that was, I mean, we're trying to get through a day and hold on to your attention. That lasted six weeks. And that's how those lectures were collected. And then I, when I went through the uh, began to look at Westminster, I got introduced to John Murray. And then I got introduced to Dick Gavin. <laughs> and then I got introduced to Palmer Robertson. And then I said, I'm going to Westminster Seminary. That's where I'm headed. And that's why I would end up here. I cannot tell you how many times I've read Preaching and Preachers. I cannot tell you what it meant to my life as I began to grasp expository preaching uh, and hopefully still growing at it. The other week, I had a guy come to the church, and he said, uh, you're Harry Reader. I said, yes, and he said, I've been listening to you on the radio for two years. And I said, oh, wonderful. And he said, I thought you were one of those California preachers on the radio. He said, I didn't know you were right here in Birmingham. And I said, well, here I am. And he said, well, I'm here too. He said, I've looked all over for a suppository preacher. <laughs> I said, well, that's not quite it, but uh, I've got some elders that probably agree with you about that. So I, I, it was just absolutely life transforming for me. I said, this is what God's called me to do. This is what I, is on my heart. Opportunities to do a number of things upon graduation from seminary, parachurch, but Christ's church that he died for. I'm an unabashed churchman. That's one institution you and I are a part of that we'll be a part of in the new heavens and the new earth that is purchased by his blood, that he loves. And then to have this enormous privilege to wash his bride with the water of the word. It's absolutely astounding that that's been given to us. And when I, I, just, I just was immediately drawn to this. And then when John came and he said, Harry, I want to do this conference. And do you realize this is the 50th year since Martin Lloyd-Jones gave those lectures? Let's make it a legacy of Martin Lloyd-Jones and let's build. I said, John, that is a great idea. And then a little bit later, he gave me an invitation. And then he gave me my assignment. And that assignment was Martin Lloyd-Jones' legacy and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in preaching preaching and the Holy Spirit. Now, I ask him to repeat for me because I thought at first he said um, the Holy Spirit and the Christian life. Now, I've been reading Martin Lloyd-Jones for I don't know how many years, and I still don't know what he believes about the Holy Spirit and the Christian life uh, and with any amount of competency that I would lecture on. And I'm still trying to, I, listen, Romans 8, you have no many, I had no idea how many times I've read that and what he has written and trying to understand it. But the Holy Spirit in preaching, clear, convicting. There's absolutely no confusion. In fact, I began to look at quotes, and I put together the quotes to bring to you, and, and then uh, realized I had to be pretty selective. I love this one. I consider it his maxim quote about the Holy Spirit in preaching. You can have knowledge, and you can be meticulous in your preparation, but without the anointing and unction of the Holy Spirit, you will have no power and your preaching will not be effective. That's pretty categorical in its statement. That's clear, isn't it? That's with conviction. Now, it's up to you to determine is he right or not. I believe he is right. That's, a, that's what I would call a quote that's a maxim. 
You can have knowledge. You can be meticulous. You can put the sermon together. It can be a homiletical masterpiece. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, when you get into that pulpit, then you won't have power and your preaching will not be effective. Not for the purpose that God has designed for it. And then this was his, what I call his quote with a trenchant analysis. We all tend to go to extremes. Some rely only on their preparation and look for nothing more. Others, as I say, tend to despise preparation and trust to unction, anointing, and inspiration of the Spirit alone. But for the preacher, there must be no either or. There must be no either or in terms of preparation and anointing. It is always prayerfully sought as a both and. The two must go together. Isn't it interesting because John in the Q&A asked me the question, wasn't it? Uh, what do you do in preparation? And there are some that say if you're doing that, you're really not trusting in the Holy Spirit. Listen, I said, that is unbelievable. How do you do your preparation? And once you've done your preparation in the Spirit, then go to the pulpit to preach in the Spirit, and your preparation is there, but you're not dependent upon it. You're dependent upon the Spirit of God. And that's what he's talking about. And then the third quote I got from him, I won't do any more, but there is one more at the end. There is a very real danger of putting our faith in our sermon rather than in the Spirit. Our faith must not be in the sermon itself. It should be in the Holy Spirit himself and what he does with it and what he does in those who hear it as Christ speaks through the Spirit of God. So when I was thinking through this, do I go to his book and talk about the Holy Spirit? Do I get more and more quotes like this? And I decided not to do that. I decided just to try to give you a brief, a, a brief, um, ex, a brief examination of a text that I think appropriately captures Martin Lloyd-Jones' view of the Spirit of God and the preaching of God's Word. And that was 1 Corinthians 2. Now, why did I go there? Well, I mentioned in the Q&A, I had the privilege to be mentored by um, a man that thankfully is still living, and I'm able to thank him for his ministry in my life. His name was Al Martin, who, in my humble, very humble opinion, I, and, and, and I do acknowledge it's an opinion, and there are many competitors to this statement. But I believe on the American side of the pond, as they say, the closest experience I've had to the preaching that Martin Lloyd-Jones delivered by God's grace and for his glory has been underneath Pastor Martin. And one of those times was at a Banner of Truth conference in 1974 when he preached from this text. And when it was over, I could not move. I just couldn't move. Everyone else was starting to move. At first, everyone was like me, I, but I just, mine lasted longer. I was nailed to the pew. I was utterly nailed to the pew. I could not move. I went through resignation from the ministry to joy of being in the ministry. I went back and forth to excitement, to repentance for what I'd been doing in ministry, to anticipation of what yet could be done in the ministry. And then, of course, when I would read about Martin Lloyd-Jones, I read and found out that's pretty much what happened almost every Sunday. He would finish, pray, turn, go to the vestry to receive, and the people would sit five, ten, fifteen minutes, not in a formal, let's pray about what you've heard, but just in the response the gravitas of what they had just heard. Another reason I chose this text is I agree so much with what Stafford and Jason and Kevin said earlier that um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, as he speaks in these matters of preaching and as he preached, the doctor basically, basically is recapturing that preaching of Edwards and 
and that preaching of Whitfield. That's why, that's why I think rightly he's called the last of the Calvinistic Methodists. Method, don't think Methodist Wesley organization. Think Methodist term to describe those great preachers of the awakening, such as Daniel Rowland, John Sinek, such as uh, Whitfield. That's what he was talking about, that Calvinistic heart and path. That's why it's logic, doctrinal clarity on fire. That's why it's named, that's why that video is named that. It was a desire for the revival of the Christian, the revival of the church, a revival that would spill over into the very community, the work of the Spirit of God with the Word of God upon the people of God by the grace of God to the glory of God. That's what filled his soul. That's why I chose this text, because here is the line going back, not only to the Great Awakening, but back to the Reformers, and then back to the Apostles. This is the apostolic vision for preaching. So take a look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and look with me in verse uh, 1. And... And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, when you jump into that text, the first word you're confronted with is clearly and, which is automatically telling you the word and there very much functions like a therefore. It's something that is built on something that's gone before. Now, I'd have no time, and you and I have no time together to completely develop that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in which he is laying some groundwork from which this statement of his vision for his ministry, as they experienced it, is said. But there are a couple of verses that I think from the previous chapter that he's building on that needs to be in your mind and my mind as we get to this matter of preaching and the demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that the people that hear you don't rest in the preaching, don't rest in the preacher, but they rest in Christ alone. And that's where their faith rests, right there. Well, here's what that and, I think, attack, uh, takes you back to. Go back with me to verse 17 of chapter 1. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the, cross, lest the cross of Christ be emptied in its power. Now, something's abundantly clear as we're reading along, and that's for the Apostle Paul, shorthand for the gospel is the word of the cross. That's a shorthand for him. And there's a reason why he does that. The shorthand is word of the cross, and he says, I've come to preach the gospel. I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. Now, Paul is not rising up in some type of backdoor arrogance saying that the inclusion of baptism in the Great Commission is not necessary to observe. That's not what he is saying. What he is saying, and pardon the pun, and what he is saying is baptism has its place. Place, obviously in the Great Commission, it is crucial as a sacrament, as a sign and seal of the covenant, but its efficacy, its meaning is downstream from the preaching of the gospel. If you get that wrong, then baptism can't be anything. You got to get that right. And I came to make sure what is foundational has been proclaimed to you. I didn't come just to get a decision and to get water on you. I came to preach the gospel of saving grace in Jesus Christ. And now that I have come to do that, as I've come with that intentional purpose, I want you to know I didn't come as your neighborhood philosopher. And remember where he is. He is in Greece. 
I came to preach Christ. I didn't empty him with reliance upon my rhetoric. I proclaimed him as he is revealed in the word of God. And then he goes on to say, for the word of the cross, there's that shorthand again, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Those who are not given eyes to see and ears to hear, it's folly. At best, for most, it's a scandal. They can't stand the gospel. They don't want any part of the gospel. The gospel is a scandal unless God changes the heart. Why? Well, there's three reasons, obvious. Number one, the gospel tells you you're a sinner and you need to be saved. Nobody wants to hear that until God opens up the heart. And not only do you need to be saved, you can't save yourself. Nobody wants to be told that. And number three, your religion can't save you. You need a savior. You can't save yourself and your religion can't save you. Now, I've got good news for you. When there was no way, God made a way, and that way is his son Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And now that's the word of the cross, where Christ made a way. And that is that Christ who is the way. So those who don't hear it, at best it's folly, for most it's a scandal. But to us who are being saved, I love that phrase, saved. I'll never forget, I was in, um, I was in Chattanooga. Uh, I was going part-time to an independent seminary. While I was helping a Reformed Baptist church move ahead, more or less as a student pastor, and as I was there, one of the Bible college, the local Bible college students, uh, obviously under assignment, and I had to, had to share the gospel with somebody for their evangelism class, and I was their target that day on Broad Street in Chattanooga, and he, he just says, are you saved? And that's just one of those moments. I've got this... I, I call it dry wit. My wife just calls it sarcasm. And uh, I said, um, um, well, yes, I've been saved, and I am being saved, and I will be saved. And uh, he looked at me and said, say what? <laughs> I said, I, I've been saved, and um, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And his next words were, are you a preacher? <laughs> well, we know the gospel says we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We have been saved from the power of sin. We have been saved from the position of sin. We have been saved from the persuasion of sin. And we are being saved from the practice of sin. And one day, we will be saved from the presence of sin. And we know that glorious truth. And that's the gospel that we preach. It is the power of God, just as it has been written. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And then, of course, that glorious and wonderful passage in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach. What? Not just preaching. But what we preach are as the NAS, through the foolishness of the message preached, that we are being saved, to save those who believe. Jews, they want, the, they want a, a, a dog and pony show. Give us a miracle. The Greeks, they want philosophical inquiry, and they want rhetoric. But to all of them, those whom God calls, the gospel is the power of God, and that's what we preach, and that's what God's called us to preach. Now, with that background, and with that background, now what does he say? He says, I came to you on a mission. Can't you imagine it? There he comes from Philippi. And I, I was with, uh, you know, Peter and I walked. We basically followed it. Thankfully, we didn't walk that 20-foot highway. We got a chance to stand on it. And then we went and got in the bus and went on the, the big highway. And then uh, we, went from we went from Philippi, and we were at Thessalonia. We were at Berea. And we go all the way down, and we're there at Athens, and we're there at Corinth to stand there in Corinth, see the Bema where he defended the faith, to go into the marketplace. You even see the holes where the poles of tent makers, where you know he would have been there. And you go to this area and you look around this place of Corinth and know, 
Paul came here, this place of rampant sexual immorality, this place of intellectual pride that, that comes down from Athens just a few miles away, this intellectual arrogance, and then this sexual immorality that is such proportion it was a, it was a uh, term of derision to call someone a Corinthian. And he said, when I came to you, brothers, boy, don't miss that. <laughs> when he came, they weren't brothers. But now when he writes the letter, they're brothers. Why? Because when I came, I came on a mission. And what was that mission? He said, well, let me tell you what it wasn't. I wasn't your next philosopher. I wasn't your next orator. I did not come to you in the testimony of God with lofty speech. I did not come as an orator. And I did not come as a sophos. I did not come as a philosopher, which is, which is basically profane theology. I didn't come as a seeker of truth. I came proclaiming the truth revealed in the Word of God. I came with the testimony of God, not the orator. Now, folks, listen, you're going into a culture, and we're constantly told, be to, to, we're instructed to connect, and I know we need to connect. But there's a lot of things that Paul could put here. I didn't, you could say, I didn't come as an entertainer. I didn't come as a comedian. But Paul goes right at the throat of where that, the arrogance of that unbelieving culture was. <clears throat> and he said, I'm not going to turn church and my ministry into what you think it ought to be. I know you value philosophers. I know you value orators. I'm not coming that way. I am a preacher. Here is the apostle teacher going to that calling as a preacher. I've come preaching. I'm up on a high mountain proclaiming to you the good news. That's what I've come to do. And in it, he is confronting that culture head on. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. So you not only see him avoiding two traps in his mission, I'm not an orator, and I'm not a, uh, and I'm not a philosopher. You know, there's this, there's, this radio, there's, this radio, there's this news station called Fox News, and there was a guy that used to be on it named Bill O'Reilly, and periodically I would be caught listen, listening to him. And he would say, I've heard him say this twice, both times my wife had to grab me lest I go through the television at him as he would talk about the philosophy of Christianity. Folks, we make no such claim. Now, we believe that Christianity impacts philosophy. It instructs philosophy. But we are not here out of self-seeking illumination as the philosophers of seeking truth. We're here proclaiming truth that's been revealed. We're people of the book. We proclaim the word of God. That's why in the Reformation that we're about to celebrate in a few days, most of them died to get the Bible into your language. That's why they did that, because we are people of the book, and the preacher is one who proclaims the book. And then when you proclaim the book, not only do you avoid two traps, there's two themes that you will always sound. No matter where you are in the book, if you're dealing with it in its content, with its context, and its trajectories, you ultimately get to the glory of a triune God revealed in the preeminence of Christ as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. So you preach Christ and him crucified. He is the ark of Noah. He is, he is the wave offering. He is the burnt offering. He is the sacrificial offering. He is the prophet of all the prophets. He is the priest of all the priests. He is the king of all the kings. Everything there is pointing to him. And so when you are preaching that book, you ultimately get to the glory of a... Tri we have a Trinitarian gospel that's proclaimed through the preeminence of Christ, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And wherever you, let me try to put your Bible, when the Spirit of God's leading you into the Word of God, which he wrote through 40-plus authors over 1,500 years, 
you're always going to get to the majesty of Christ in its trajectory, in its content, in its context. Now, folks, I am not talking about what I am now seeing passing as historical redemptive preaching. And that is not doing your work in the text and trying to allegorize Jesus into the text. But when you do its work right, you see how and why Jesus. Wouldn't you like to have been in that Bible study on the road to Emmaus? We're beginning with Moses and with all the prophets. He explained himself in all the scriptures. What do you, what, and and did, did you see what happened? Their heart, their eyes were down. They were depressed. And then Jesus, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, opened the scriptures, and, he, and their hearts were opened, their eyes were opened, their minds were opened. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I cannot open minds. We can't open hearts. We can't open eyes. But we can open the scriptures. And that's what the Spirit of God uses. And it's a little bit like... I went to, so I lived in the athletic dorm at uh, East Carolina University, and my grandmother used to knit things for us, and so she had knit me a present, and when I opened up my trunk in the athletic dorm, th this particular suite filled with football and baseball players, my grandmother's had knit me a pair of footies to wear to the bathroom. <laughs> I had to confess to my grandmother, grandma, I never wore them. I did keep them safe, and I have brought them home, but I never wore them. My grandmother could knit. But if my grandmother knit you a sweater, and there's a pick in it, whatever you do, don't pull the pick. You know what a pick is? A thread hanging out. If you got a sweater that my grandmother knit and a pick, a thread's ha hanging out, don't pull the thread. Don't pull. If you do, you've just got a ball of yarn because <laughs> it's just one thread. That's your Bible. Wherever you pick and pull is the glory of the triune God revealed in the preeminence of Christ. And where Jesus leads us to is the cross. The manger, praise God. The empty tomb, praise God. The, com the ascension, praise God. The second coming, praise God. But the crucial point that he brings you to is the cross, where the holiness of God meets the love of God, where the Son of God saves sinners by the grace of God to the glory of God, right there at the cross. And that's what we preach it comes through as the gospel is the foundation, the formation, and the motivation of our preaching. You never go beyond the gospel, but you go deeper. You go higher. You go further. You go, you go to all kinds of implications of it as you deal with each and every text in expository preaching. And that's what Paul did that he was there. Two traps, two themes. Now watch. He came on the mission, and then he maintained the mission. And I was with you. I came to you, avoiding two traps with two themes. Then I was with you. I maintained the mission in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so he says, while I was with you, I avoided those traps when I came. I, avoided, I had two themes when I came to you on this mission. And then when I stayed there, and by the way, he stayed there as far as we know, the second longest time he stayed in any other place, Ephesus three years, Corinth 18 months. And when I was with you, and that there when I served with you, as I was with you, I did not, in arrogance, rely on my gifts and abilities. No, when I looked at myself, it was with fear and trembling. Who is sufficient for this? John asked me, he said, how, how did the night go? How did you sleep? <laughs> I slept last night just like I did every Saturday night. Very little. I wish I would thought after 40-something years it'd get easier. It just doesn't. It doesn't at all. Because we know we are not sufficient for this task. 
yet God has ordained this task, then we flee to the Holy Spirit that it might be the demonstration not of the preacher, but it might be the demonstration of the Spirit and not the manipulation of the preacher, but the power of the Spirit of God. Logic on fire. Sometimes you don't know when the Spirit of God is there and how he's doing and what he's doing. Sometimes it's because it's a long-term work he's doing in people that are listening. Sometimes it's because he's doing something right then, right then in that moment, but you just don't know it. Would you like to know how many times I have walked up that aisle after giving the benediction while the congregation sings the doxology, and all the while I am repenting? Oh, God, that was the worst sermon that has ever possibly been preached in all of humanity. I mean, on the way back. And then you get back there and somebody comes, Pastor, that was the most powerful message I've ever heard you preach. And you want to say, what sermon were you listening to? <laughs> were you tuned in on the iPod or something? Or, Pastor, God brought me to the end of myself today. Would you pray with me? I want to give my life to Christ. Or he convicted me of this, and you're wondering... But then there are some times you know when he's there. <laughs> there are moments. I've had probably less than two handfuls. But I know, I mean, there are moments when I've been preaching, and I could tell the Holy Spirit's doing something. I mean, it's so, I don't want it to end. In fact, I want to go sit down and listen myself. It's so good. <laughs> and you know it's him. I mean, it's like, the, it's like my, my brother Carl Ellis says when he says, the ghost has come. He has come, he has showed up, and he is doing his work. Don't get in his way. That is a glorious moment when it comes. Well, let me just give you some things that I think this demonstration of the Spirit of God in power, what does that demonstration look like? Just a couple of thoughts, and then I'll, I'll close in prayer. Now, I'm going to close with one quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones and in prayer. But here, just jot these down. When you're preaching in the demonstration of the Spirit in power, I'd say the doctor would affirm this. It's all over preaching and preachers. Here's what you need to know. Seldom is the, seldom in the demonstration of the spirit and power in the pulpit, seldom is it manifested in the pulpit until it's first manifested in the life of the preacher. Now, he is not dependent upon you attaining some level for him to bless you. I have seen that time and time again in my life. But here's what I do know. The spirit of God, when he visits the pulpit first, now, there's exceptions that prove the rule, but by and large, he first visits in demonstration and power the preacher. We're standing up calling people in the name of Christ to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. <laughs> then the Spirit of God needs to be our life. It is in Him that we live and move and have our being. Don't you love it? Before they go out to the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1, what does Jesus say to do? Get back up to that upper room. Get up on your knees. Get down on your knees and begin to pray, and the Holy Spirit is going to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, what? You shall be my witnesses with power. When the Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit will come, and you will be my witnesses in power. And that's how you know when the preacher's been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Just as you can't, you could not hear Martin Lloyd-Jones preach without hearing Jesus constantly. He was always the focal point. 
He is always talking like the Apostle Paul of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is a spirit-filled Christian. That is a spirit-filled church. A spirit-filled Christian, a spirit-filled church is not by any one of the gifts, not even by the fruit of the Spirit. Praise God for the fruit of the Spirit. Praise God for the gifts. But that's not what identifies a spirit-filled church. And a spirit-filled church and a spirit-filled preacher is all about Jesus. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have power to be my witnesses. Packer is right. The Holy Spirit is the shy spirit. He doesn't anoint you to bring attention to himself. He anoints you to bring every attention to Christ. And that Christ becomes all and in all. You make much of Jesus when the Holy Spirit takes hold of our life. And when the Holy Spirit takes hold of your life, then God's taken hold of your life. That's why Paul loved to call Timothy man of God. You're a man who is for God. You're a man who's been purchased by God. You are a man of God. Now, what is the enemy? Brothers and sisters, listen to me. The enemy of the anointing of the Spirit of God upon your life to bring you to the pulpit the enemy is a secret life that doesn't belong to the Lord. Every pastor I have talked with, and in the own inclinations of my soul and heart, it is that secret life that must be avoided. That extra computer that only you know the password to. Those hours that nobody knows where you are. But the Lord does. There's three phrases in the Bible that utterly frighten me. One is the day that the words are given, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. <coughs> Secondly, the second frightening words to me in the Bible, God gave them over to the desires of their heart. You're looking at a culture right now that has been described in the three steps of a downward spiral in Romans 1. And it's not only that God brings judgment upon sexual anarchy and sexual immorality, the presence of sexual immorality and sexual abnormality as accepted and normalized in the culture is the evidence of God's judgment. God gave them over. What's the third one, Harry? Do not grieve, do not quench the Holy Spirit. That word quench literally means putting water on a campfire. Here is the fire I want in my life. Is my life surrendered or is my life quenching the Spirit, throwing the water on the work of the Spirit. I'm going to paraphrase Martin Lloyd-Jones here, but this is essentially what he was saying. If the Spirit of God would go to the extraordinary length of suffering our self-reliance, our self-absorption, our self-promotion, our arrogance, our apathy, our carelessness to the things of God, if the Spirit of God would go to extraordinary lengths to suffer that, even to the point of allowing the promise, presence, and power of the Spirit of God to be quenched in our life, is that not enough to call us to repentance? To flee to Christ for a fresh anointing of His Spirit, confessing our sins, so that when we enter our study, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I just borrowed that from Spurgeon. I remember standing on the 13 steps of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and we're given this information by his wife. Every Sunday when he mounted those 13 steps, each step he would pause as he went to the task of preaching to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. That you say as you go into the study, 
I believe in the Holy Spirit. You say as you mount the pulpit, the sacred desk, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Secondly, let me move more rapidly so I can beat time. Uh, I can get this appropriately in the time allotment. Secondly, that manifestation of power and the demonstration of the Spirit of God does not only come to the preacher first before the pulpit, it also shows up in a preacher's prioritized life. The preacher does not live his life, his life serendipity any, any more than he preaches serendipity. The preacher is, has a priority. Did you see what he said? I determined. I intentionally came on a mission with a determination. Here's my manner. Here's my message. Here's my means. I love the moment that's recounted again by a wife of a preacher. Bethan says, talks about the time, I think it was in 1959 when she and, and, um, and Martin Lloyd-Jones were on vacation in Wales. And they were in a very small church. And it was a Wednesday prayer time. And, um, and they were, um, I'm sorry, it was a Sunday night prayer time. And everybody was cognizant of who was in the room, but nobody was asking him anything. He was on vacation. And finally, he sees them continue. He says, would you like for me to say a few words? And they said, oh, we don't want to disturb your vacation. And Bethan said, don't worry. Preaching is his life. People have asked me, I don't know why they're asking me now, what are your retirement plans? I don't know why they're asking that. <laughs> well, I'll give you another words of a mentor I was privileged to learn from that's now with Jesus. Two of my mentors are with Jesus now. Uh, I remember talking with R.C. and he said, well, Harry, my retirement plans is they'll have to peel my hands off the pulpit and put me in the grave. Brothers and sisters, and now here's the good news I tell Briarwood. Here's the good news. They're going to peel my hands off the pulpit, but it doesn't have to be Briarwood's pulpit. I have no interest in going around picking up conch shells on a beach. It's my life. That's why Paul said to Timothy, I fought the fight. I finished the race. I've been poured out as a drink offering, not a burnt offering, a drink offering. A burnt offering, you still got ashes left. A drink offering, nothing is left. Finish the race. It's our life. It's what God calls us to do. And yes, I understand other priorities. I understand family, marriage. I understand all that. But I'm talking about my calling from the Lord. Yes, fulfill your responsibility as a husband, a father. Yes, all of that. But my calling is that pulpit ministry and prayer. Prayer and the word. Prayer and the word. In Acts 6, there's this charge of racism that's brought against the elders of the church at, uh, um, in Jerusalem. And they realize there's a problem. There's not an equi equitable distribution of the mercy funds, but the problem is not our prejudice. The problem is we can't do that if we do mercy ministry better in this thousands of members church. If we do mercy ministry better, we're going to have to neglect prayer and the word, and we must not neglect prayer and the word. So let's raise up, and my personal conviction, there is the office of deacon that raises up under the authority of the elders, ordained to administration, stewardship, and mercy ministry of the church. But what I want you to see is what they repeat two times. We can't, you want to know the problem? We'll, you think we got a problem? We've got one. We got to solve this problem. Good leadership. But we're not going to create a bigger problem to solve this problem. We're not going to neglect prayer and the word to get this right. Let's get these people to get this right, and we will not neglect the prayer and the word. Now, what is that telling you? That's telling you up until that time, they were preoccupied with what? This isn't hard. Hey, in Birmingham, we go back and forth, okay? <laughs> what does that tell you they were doing up until that time? They were preoccupied with prayer and the word. Are you? Are you, preacher? Are you and I preoccupied with everything else and we're going to squeeze in prayer in the Word? 
They were absolutely occupied, preoccupied with prayer and the Word. Now, listen, there's other things we got to do. How are we going to? We're going to work on efficiency out here. But effectiveness, if we're going to be leaders and pastors of this church, we've got to be in prayer, the priority of prayer, and the primacy of preaching. The primacy of preaching. It's not the exclusive means of grace, but it's the primary means of grace. You lose that, you lose baptism. You lose the Lord's Supper. You lose prayer. You you lose fellowship. You lose everything. It's got to be that preoccupation. And if the Spirit of God is in our heart, then we will be preoccupied. Well, Pastor, I want to reach the unchurched. Well, let me commend a book to you. It's Tom Rainer's book, Surprising Insights on Reaching the Unchurched. I love a book that confirms my prejudices, so I recommend it to you. <laughs> he went and did a study of churches who had unchurched people, and he talked to the unchurched people. Now, these are, these are not unchurched people who never come to church and tell you why they're never going to come to church. These are unchurched people who weren't coming to church, have come to Christ, and now they've been involved in a church for three or more years. And he asked them, what brought you to Christ? What brought you to this church? Do you know what the number, and you can give multiple answers. Do you know what the number one answer? He put 13 of their, 14 of their answers, and 14 answers that basically gave to him. Do you know what number one answer was? 91% of them said, preaching and the preacher. See, you know what we're told today? Get rid of the pulpit, put up a lectern, do, a, do, do, do me a coach me up talking. If you want to reach unchurched people, it's all in the music. Do you know where music was? Number, th number 12. 3% said the music. 91% said preacher and preaching. 88% said doctrinal clarity and conviction. You see, we're told, no, you got to act like you're a relativist until you get them in, and a couple of years later, let them know you believe in objective truth. <laughs> now, people are still asking the question, what's truth? And we get the opportunity to preach it in love and love with the truth. Well, uh, again, I'm sorry. I got to do this faster. So, um, let me just give you this last uh, couple. Here's the third one. The demonstration of the, it, it, when it, the Spirit of God comes to the preacher, comes to the prioritized life of the preacher, and, and then the, it comes to the preacher and his preaching. He's not only on mission, he's on message. Brothers and, brothers and sisters, we preach the whole counsel of God. And the channel markers are the gospel. It's the foundation, it's the formation, and it's the motivation. When he's saying he's teaching Christ and him crucified, do you think Paul dealt with sexual ethics? Do you think Paul dealt with church government? Do you think Paul dealt with the family? All the evidences are there in First and Second Corinthians, but what he is telling you is whatever he dealt with, the foundation, the formation, and the motivation was the gospel. Christ and him crucified. It wasn't that he just had one sermon. It's that he preached the whole counsel of God, but the preeminence of Christ and his work of grace on the cross permeated and penetrated everything. It was from Christ and the cross that he uncovered sin, as painful as it is. And it was Christ and the cross that was the solution. And then Christ and the cross was the motivation. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Wife, submit, complete, come alongside your husband. You're not conquering him. You're not conquered by him. You're completing him. Why? Because the, the bride that Christ purchased at the cross, there was a man who left his father to cleave to his bride and nothing shall separate him from her. And she is called to be joint heirs with him. It's that cross that defines that marital dynamic. It's the cross that leads a parent to evangelize and discipline. That's what parenting is, evangelizing and discipling our children. And so I'm, I get kind of excited about this. I, and, and, then, and then when the Spirit of God is able, the Spirit of God, yeah, I love that figure of the surgical knife. Here's my, here's my, when the Holy Spirit is with you in the preaching of the gospel, I, it's like my mama. Um, when I was six years old, I went next door to play, and I went to pet the dog. I didn't realize the dog was eating an ice cream cone, and the dog thought I was come to take its ice cream cone, and the dog literally almost ate me alive. My mother scooped me up. She brought me 
set me on the toilet seat, and I said, Mom, Mom, is it mercuricum or methylate? Mercuricum didn't burn. Methylate, it burned. She says, methylate, son. It'll help you. It'll hurt, but it'll help. I'm going to put it on, and then I'll blow on it. I'll never forget. It's just like yesterday. She put the methylate on, and it burned those open wounds. And then I said, blow, Mama, blow. And she blew, and it was okay. That's your preaching. Expose the sin. Uncover it. It hurts. And then the Spirit of God through your preaching blows the sweetness of the gospel. In Christ, you're forgiven. In Christ, you're new. In Christ, you're able to go forth in power. Fourthly, your preaching will have the power not of you, but of the Holy Spirit. Your preaching will have the power of the Holy Spirit. I will just quote what some of the brothers said. There are some men who will leave the seminary who love to preach. There will be some who will love to preach the word. They love to preach. Others will love to preach the word. But there will be those who love to preach the word that people will be changed in and for Christ. You don't preach so that people have more catalogs in their theological knowledge. You preach for lives to be transformed, and they rest in Christ alone. We preached for lives to be changed and to be renewed. That's what we preach for. That requires the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel. Listen, I just shared with you about tweeting and how I use it, but you're not going to out-tweet the world. You're not going to get worship services that can out-concert and out-entertain the world. But you can preach the gospel. It doesn't get there any other way. Not even a passion play. Passion movies. Can't do it. There's two things passion movies and passion plays can't do. They can't tell people what the agony of the cross is. They always, just like the Mel Gibson movie, got fixated on the physical torture and punishment. Listen, with all due respect, physically, some Christians have died worse deaths than Jesus. The agony of the cross was not in the physical torture, which I'm not... Uh, minimizing the agony was the fact that the Son of God uttered these words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No words from heaven. This is my Son in whom I am pleased. Only the, uh, the un unendurable, unfathomable cup of the wrath of God was to be drank, drank to the bottom. No movie can show that, but you can preach it. And that was because of God's love for you. And who crucified Jesus? Not Jew, not Gentile, not you, not my sin. The Father put his Son to death for you, for me. You preach something. Can I give you the shortcut of apologetics? Every religion tells people what they got to do or give to maybe get to heaven. Jesus says that's not the answer. That's the problem. The answer is the one who came from heaven and gave himself for you. And we can preach that with power. Finally, when you preach in the Spirit, people don't walk away with your sermon. They walk away with Jesus' sermon. I really mean that. I really mean that. That's why we used to wear robes. The preacher is blocked out. It's the preaching that's everything. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Did you hear that? To be saved, you got to call upon him. To call upon him, you got to believe in him. To believe in him, you have to hear him. 
not about him. You have to hear him. My sheep know my voice, and they follow me. This is, this is why I don't sleep. This is why I'm overwhelmed with the inadequacies of it. It's that somehow, some way, in God's great power and majesty, when you preach in the power of the Spirit with faithfulness to the Word of God, it's no longer you who speak, but Christ himself begins to speak to the heart of his people and says, Come. Come unto me. And then as you preach, people who came leave blessed because they did not hear the sermon you preached, but the one that Christ preached through you to their hearts and to their souls. I agree with the doctor. There is no greater privilege than to be a preacher of the gospel and proclaim Jesus the sum, the center, the substance, and the circumference of all of our life. And we get to preach him. Here's your last quote. To me, the doctor said, there is nothing more terrible for a preacher than to be in the pulpit all alone without the presence of God. May I put it in the positive. There is nothing more glorious than to be a preacher in the pulpit. And the Holy Spirit is there with you. And it's no longer you, but him who brings the voice of Jesus to the people. Preach the word. Father, thank you for the moments together in your word. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Would you be at work in each and every, of their, every one of their lives? Father, I pray that we, when we come to that pulpit, those who are preparing to go to that pulpit even now, give them a sense of where they're headed, the sacredness of these moments to prepare themselves as instruments in your hands and even now to become familiar and gloriously, wonderfully invigorated by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do your work in their lives. Do your work in their preaching. Meet them in the study. Walk with them to the pulpit. And then, Father, I pray that when they open the word, the Spirit of God will open eyes, minds, and hearts, and they shall see and hear Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.